If you remember, uh, last week, in essence, we began a new series called Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. And if you remember, we looked at a hymn briefly, and this is the first line of the hymn, which says, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free, from our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's, co- Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Now this is the first verse of the popular hymn uh, by uh, Charles Wesley, uh, got a nice picture of the guy there, uh, and this has been the inspiration for our current series leading up to Christmas Uh, We have been and we will be looking at the theme of Jesus, the theme of Jesus' long-expected coming. You see, 2,000 years ago, when God became flesh and was born in a manger, it was the fulfillment of a plan promised long ago. Right from the very beginning of the Old Testament, we see this. We see these hints of what is to come. We see these promises Uh, of what is to come. And that is basically what we're going to be doing these next, well, few uh, couple weeks leading up to Christmas is looking along the biblical timeline. And there's many different points we can look at, but taking a couple of key points where we see Jesus promised, where we see Jesus foreshadowed, where we see it all pointing to Jesus and him coming. And last week we were looking at the events of Adam and Eve, the tragic events of the fall. And this week, we get to jump forward along the biblical timeline to a man called Abraham. Now, in between, the, uh, the, between Adam and Eve and, and Abraham, there's a no, and loads of different things happen. There's like Cain and Abel and Noah and the flood and the Tower of Babel. But basically, generation after generation has passed by. But mankind is still waiting for the one who would crush the serpent's head. And today, as we uh, look at Genesis, we are once again going to see big arrows being pointed to the coming of Jesus. Before we uh, get into our text, let me just give a bit of context. We see that in uh, Genesis chapter 12, uh, God appears to Abraham, uh, who at the time was called Abram. And basically, God makes this amazing promise to Abraham. And we read this. Now, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now what an amazing promise that is. Imagine that. Imagine you're just doing life as normal and suddenly God shows up, speaks to you and says, Hey, I'm going to give you a land. From you and your descendants, I'm going to create a nation. And this nation is going to bless the whole world. Now you can imagine Abraham must have been just humbled in awe because this is just simply grace. As you look at the, uh, the life of Abraham, he was by no means a perfect man. He was a man of faith, but he was by no means a perfect man. And here we see this great grace of God just being like, hey, I'm going to give you this amazing promise. But there was just one problem. Abraham was advanced in years and his wife was barren. They could not have children. And so unfortunately, they tried to take matters into their own hands, if you you know the account. In essence, they try to take matters into their hands, believing that the promise is dependent on them. 
And so as we know, Abraham has a child with his maidservant. And as you can imagine, things don't go well and there's consequences for their sin. And this is often the case right, when we try to do things in our own strength. But despite their sin, God remains faithful. God miraculously allows Abraham to have a child with his wife, Sarah, just as God promised, and she gives birth to Isaac. So you can imagine, after all these years since the, since the promise came, and finally Abraham has a son, the son of promise, And you can imagine how Abraham enjoys his son and watches his son grow up. But then there comes a point where God comes to Abraham with a shocking command. We read this in Genesis 22 and verse 1. This is going to be the main uh, bulk of our text. We read this. Now it came to pass after these things... That God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. An absolutely shocking command that God gives to Abraham. Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, the son whom you love, the son of promise. And to sacrifice his son is to kill him. Now, there are two things at stake here. Uh, Number one, the son whom Abraham loved. His own son and his son's life is at stake here. And then number two, the second thing that is at stake here is the promise. See, Abraham loved his son. And and God, God clearly says that. And for any loving parent, such an act is unthinkable. And think about it, right? It's heartbreaking for a parent to witness the death of their son, even more so if they are the cause of that death. So not only would this mean the losing of his son, but it also means an end to the promise. The promise that through Abraham and his wife Sarah, God would bring about descendants and a nation through Isaac. And the question that must have been going through Abraham's head and and, and ours as well, if we didn't know uh, the the full conclusion of what's going on, is, is what is God doing? What is God doing in giving such a command? And although Abraham does not understand it at the time, what the author tells us is that God was testing Abraham. He was examining his heart, examining his faith. Now there are multiple places in the Bible that speak of us as Christians going through moments of trials, going through moments of testing. And perhaps two of the most well-known are found in uh, the the letters, uh, in the books of 1 Peter and the book of James. Because as we look at these passages, which we'll jump to in a second, the testing of our faith, in essence it does two things. It both exposes and produces. We read this in 1 Peter Uh, chapter 1 and verse 6 to 9 says this in this you greatly rejoice though for no now for a little while if need be you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation 
of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Lo, now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So that's our first passage from First Peter. And then we read this in James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into tr- various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Two things that we get from looking at those two passages. And uh, in regards to the testing of our faith. Number one, the testing of our faith, it exposes the genuineness of our faith. And then number two, the testing of our faith produces patience. So let me briefly uh, look at that uh, first one. So we'll go back up. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you be grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, though tested by fire, may be found. The testing of our faith, when we go through times of trial and through testing, it exposes the genuine nature of our faith. Is the faith that we have genuine? And the second thing it does is, as I say, it produces patience. That word patience can be translated as cheerful or hopeful endurance. Constancy, uh, enduring, patient, continuance. Testing exposes, but then it also produces. And I want us to give, uh, I'll give you an example of how a test that can happen in regards to testing. I want you to think back. When was the last time uh, you experienced a test? And I'm, I'm not talking about spiritual testing, but let's talk about, just as an illustration, uh, when was the last time you underwent a test? Perhaps it was many years ago at school. Perhaps it was recently. Maybe you've been studying recently, or maybe you've learned how to drive not, in a, not too long ago. But I want you to think back to one of those moments. And I'm going to share with you one of mine. When I was at university, uh, I I had, at the end of my three years, I had a final recital. You see, the beauty of being in the arts, being a musician, was that you get to avoid the sit-down exam. So so those of you had to do that when you were at school and uni. But uh, for music, you don't need to sit down. Generally, you don't need to sit down and write loads of stuff depending on your modules. But the uni I went to, a lot of it was performance-based. So the end test was, at the end of the final year, was this recital. And so for the whole year, you are preparing for this recital. You are learning different songs. You are part of a band, and you're rehearsing. You're practicing. And then you get to the final exam, the final recital, and you perform. You perform, I think it was like 30 minutes. You perform your various songs in front of, thankfully, an audience of friends and family, but perhaps not so thankfully, also a panel of examiners. And they see how you perform, and then they mark it, and then they give you a grade at the end of it. And in that testing, in that recital, it revealed my skill as a musician. It revealed, okay, what skills does he have in this area of being a musician? But then it also, the very process, grew me as a musician. So in that time, there was the exposing, but then there was also the growing. There was the exposing, but also the producing. My recital exposed the kind of musician I was, but then it also produced in me and changed me as a musician. And in a similar way, the testing of our faith, it reveals how genuine our faith is, but then it also grows us in our faith as 
believers. You see, all of us will face seasons of testings as believers. All of us. Now, sometimes the source of that testing may be a specific trial given directly by God. Sometimes that's how God works, as we see with Abraham. And there are other moments where God's like, no, I'm going to give you this specific trial, this specific testing. But often... The day-to-day testing of our faith often comes through perhaps not a directly given task by God, but rather through just the general challenges and suffering and difficulties that we face in life. You see, as most of you are aware, suffering, seasons of difficulty, they are natural parts of life. And that stems really back to last week when the fall takes place. Everything, whole of creation was affected by the fall. We still feel the effect of that today. As Christians, we will go through moments of, of challenge, of difficulty, of suffering. And those moments of suffering and difficulty in our lives, they become moments when our faith is tested. In the case of First Peter, when Peter is writing, the early church, they were, they were scattered, they were persecuted, they were suffering. And there's another similarity between these two passages, which is really challenging. I don't know if you noticed it, but what does Peter say? Peter says, let's go back up, let's see if this works. Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice. What does James say? Count it all joy. Rejoice. Now, what are they getting at, Peter and James? I don't think they're wanting us to delight in suffering itself. It's not saying, hey, you're going through a hard time, just put a smile on your face, yeah. No, they're they're talking about something deeper, right? Because Peter acknowledges that these trials are causing grief. You have been grieved by various trials. Peter and James are not making light of the trials, but rather they say, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's pain, yes, there is sorrow, but in the midst of it, there is cause to rejoice because of two things. Number one, because... This testing is temporary. This suffering is temporary. And for us as Christians, this suffering will come to an end. But then also this suffering has a purpose. And you see that, right? Peter, he says this. If need be, though now for a little while, if need be. The suffering we experience as Christians is temporary. One day it will end when we see Jesus face to face and there is no more pain, there is no more sorrow, there is no more suffering. Our suffering as Christians is temporary, but then also we know and are encouraged that God uses our suffering for a purpose. He uses it to reveal our faith, but then he also uses it to grow our faith. I want that to encourage you. Are you going through a season of trial? If you're not, chances are it won't be too long till you do. I don't want that to, <laughs> uh, to put a down on things, but I want to encourage you. Yes, as believers, we can always be growing in our faith. And yes, as believers, we don't always respond to situations in the perfect way. But I want to encourage you, if you're going through a season of testing, God is allowing that to take place because it is an opportunity to reveal the faith that you have. But then it is also an opportunity for that faith to grow. Uh, There's this quote um, 
Greg Laurie's said it. I've heard other people say similar quotes. So I don't know who originally came up with this quote, but I think it's really great. A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. As, as Christians, we should not be surprised if we go through moments of testing. But I want you to encourage you, the Lord allows that to happen because he wants to be like, hey, I want you to see that the faith you have in me is real. And the only way you're going to see that, the only way other people are going to see that, is if that faith is tested. But even in the testing, I'm going to grow it. So one of the reasons that God puts Abraham through this situation is like, hey, I want to test you, Abraham. But in doing so, your faith, the genuineness of your faith is going to be revealed. But not only that, I'm going to grow you in your faith. And so we read, this is how Abraham responds to the call. It says this, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Now from this, these few verses, it's clear to see that it took Abraham a few days to get to the mountain, to get to this place where God had told him to sacrifice his son. It says that he arrived on the third day, which means that Abraham had opportunity to turn back. His act of faith and kind of wasn't this kind of sudden, on the spur of the moment, sudden act, but rather it was this conscious choice that he was making over multiple days. And even before he gets to the mountain, he is displaying bit by bit these little steps of faith. Another word you could use for faith is trust. And this is further seen in his interaction with the servants who have accompanied them. Because look at what he tells them. He tells his servants to remain and then he says to them, we will come back to you. Abraham is fully committed to laying down the life of his son, but at the same time, he is fully convinced that they're going to come back, that both of them are going to come back. And we'll talk about that a bit more later on. But next verse, verse 6, uh, we read this. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. And then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So Isaac looks around and he notices that something is missing, and that is the sacrifice. They have the wood, they have the fire, they have the knife, but he's like, but no lamb to sacrifice. Now obviously he is unaware of what God's command to Abraham has been, that he is the sacrifice. And so he asks him, hey dad, where's the sacrifice? Like we have all the other stuff, we're going up to sacrifice, but dad, there's something missing, and that is the lamb. Dad, where's the sacrifice? And I want you to look at Abraham's response because without even realizing it, I love Abraham's response because without even realizing it, he points us to the gospel. He says this in verse 8. In response to where is the sacrifice, he says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so the two of them went together. God will provide for himself the lamb. 
That is the gospel in a nutshell. That is the good news of Jesus. God will provide for himself the lamb. Keep that in mind because we'll come back to that at the end. And so verse 9, the time has now come. We read this, Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and he laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, here I am. Could you imagine that? At the very last moment, God intervenes. Just as the knife is about to come down on his son, the angel of the Lord cries out, Abraham, Abraham. His faith has been tested. It's been pushed to the absolute limits and it has proved to be genuine. And so we read this in verse 12. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son your only son from me. There are two things uh, highlighted here which is revealed about Abraham's faith. And in, in essence, two things which God commends. Number one, we see that Abraham fears God. And then number two, we see Abraham's willingness not to withhold anything from God. So here we see his fear of God and his willingness not to hold anything back from God. So let's think of those two things for a brief second. Abraham's fear of God. Another word you could use for fear is awe. Uh, the uh, dictionary.com explains or as an overwhelming feeling of reverence, of admiration, of fear produced by that which is grand, sublime, extremely powerful. Abraham has a fear, he has an awe of God. I want you to think about the last time you were left in awe of something. Uh, for me personally, it's often when I see uh, moments of creation, right? Where you see something in creation which is so big, which is so grand, it leaves you feeling small. You're like, wow, that is incredible. And you see yourself in comparison to it. And you're like, wow, that is amazing. And there is this healthy kind of fear of that kind of power. And this is how, this is kind of the, the sense that we get of Abraham here. He sees God as big and he sees everything else as small in comparison, including himself. He sees the grand nature of God, the beauty of God, the power of God. He sees him as one to be respected, to be honored, to be treasured, to be listened to, to be in fear of. When we are in awe of God, the natural fruit of that is a willingness to obey God. It's a willingness to listen to God. It's a, it's a, in essence, it's a, a willingness to take God seriously, to say, hey God, I care when you speak. I care about what you say and I want to do what you say because I'm in awe of you. Because I truly see you for who you are. We see in Abraham's faith, we see fear of God exposed, a genuine fear of the Almighty. But then we see a willingness not to withhold anything from God. And it begs the question, is there anything in your life that if God said, let go, you would say, not a chance? 
Is there anything in your life, may that be a particular area or whatever it is, is there anything in your life that you're trying to withhold from God? In essence, it's like, yeah, God, you can have this part of my life, but this aspect of my life, off limits, God. You can't touch it. I'm going to withhold that from you. Or are we like Abraham who, in this fear and reverence, of God and this trust of God is willingness is willing not to withhold even that which is most precious to him his son and such was his faith he says God if you tell me to do this I do it because God I trust you Here we see Abraham's faith and trust in God and God's word and God's promises. The New Testament book of Hebrews gives us uh, insight into what is going through the heart and the mind of, um, of Abraham at this moment. It says this, by faith. Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. God trust sorry Abraham trusted God and the promises that God had made to him. In essence, it's like Abraham saying, God, you have promised me that Isaac is the son of promise. You've promised me that through him it's gonna, you're gonna bring about a nation, and I trust the word that you've spoken, God. Even though my circumstances are challenging the promise right now. I trust you because you are powerful enough even to raise him from the dead in order to keep your promises. Because of your promises, God, because you are trustworthy, God, as painful as this might be, I trust you. And so I obey and so I'm not going to withhold him from you. Such is his trust in God and his promises. Do you trust God? In essence, that, what, that, is, in, that is in essence what faith is, a willingness to trust God. To say, God, you are trustworthy. I trust you. And that trust is going to be tested. There are going to be moments where we hear the promises of God and there will be a testing that comes. And in those moments, God encourages us and calls us to follow in the example of Abraham. It says, God, I trust you. God... I trust you. Verse 13, uh, back in our text, we read this. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked up. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, do you remember... Earlier on, what Abraham said to Isaac, he said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And after the angel has spoken, Abraham looks, he turns around, and lo and behold, what does he find? He finds a ram. He finds the sacrifice. God provided the sacrifice. And this sacrifice took the place of Isaac. It was a substitution. 
the ram provided by God took the place of Isaac. And so we read this in verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Abraham names the place the Lord will provide. Now some translations translate this as Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Now clearly Abraham does this in response to the provision, to the sacrifice that God provided for him at that time, right? But I believe that something more significant is taking place because Abraham is not just celebrating past events but unbeknown to him most likely he is pointing forward to future events to a future provision Uh, the website gotquestions.org says this i find it's really helpful jehovah jireh is not the lord did provide but the lord will provide In other words, the name does not simply uh, memorialize a past event. It anticipates a future action. Now, I wonder, and these are just my thoughts, but allow me to to take you on the the mind for a second of, of, of Mr. Taylor, okay? These are just my thoughts, but... I find it interesting that in this period, in this moment with Abraham, it is a ram and not a lamb that God provides at the time. I I don't, I don't, this is just my fault, so don't, you know, don't take this as gospel, but I don't think that's coincidence. I think God's quite deliberate in in providing a sacrifice at the moment, a ram, but not a lamb. Because in some ways, it still leaves us leaving this encounter, asking the question, in essence, still looking for the lamb. If you remember at the beginning, right, Abraham said God will provide the lamb for himself. And so I'm asking the question, well, where is the lamb which God will provide for himself? Now, the next time, I believe, um, the next time we, we, we read of a lamb being spoken of is when we get to the book of Exodus and we come to the events of the Passover, where as slaves in Egypt, God commands his people to take a lamb. And the blood of that lamb is put on the, the doorposts of the houses so that when judgment comes, when that final play comes, when God's judgment comes, all of the houses that has the blood of the lamb over it, judgment passes over. Judgment doesn't touch that house. Judgment passes over. And this, that event of the Passover not only brought about the redemption of Israel from slavery, but what did it do? It pointed to the greater lamb to come, to Jesus. Where is the lamb that God will provide for himself? Well, John the Baptist provides the answer to that question. In John's gospel, we read this. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the long awaited lamb of God, the lamb which God would provide for himself. And through the sacrifice of Jesus, sacrifice of the lamb, our sin is taken away. At this time of year, we, we as Christians, we celebrate the coming of the lamb who would deal with our sin, who would bring about redemption. I want to encourage you, you can have your sins taken away. You can have your sins forgiven. And it is through putting your faith in the Lamb. 
the lamb that was the perfect sacrifice on our behalf, the lamb who died on the cross in our place, Jesus. There are so many different ways that this amazing event of Abraham points us towards the gospel, points us towards where is the lamb that God is going to provide for himself. It points us, it's even a foreshadow, right? Abraham's willing not to withhold his son. And what do we see God the Father do? God the Father did not withhold his one and his only son. And even in the promise, which we see as we close in the next few verses, once again, pointing to the coming of Jesus. Uh, Genesis uh, chapter 22 and verse uh, 15. We uh, read this. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice, so Abraham returned to his young men. And they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus is the seed through which all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, when the angel comes to the shepherds uh, at the birth of Jesus, the angel says, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. All people. Jesus is the blessing for all nations. You see, the message of Jesus, Jesus isn't just for one group of people. He isn't just for uh, one particular nation or one particular age group or one particular culture or one particular color. The message of Jesus is for all people, no matter what nation they are from. Jesus says, come, my sacrifice was for you by faith accepted. (laughs) The, the message of Jesus, and I want to encourage you, we are very blessed as a church to be a very multicultural church. We have people from all over the world, and praise God, and part of that is, in part, you know, London is a very multicultural place. But I want that to encourage us and remind us, like, Jesus isn't just for British people or for English people or for Londoners, but rather people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, Jesus wants his message to be shared with them, and he wants them to come to a saving knowledge of him. The book of Revelation, right at the end, uh, we, get, um, we get a glimpse of this. Revelation chapter 5. Now when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. And having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue, and people, and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, 
and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. As we go to prayer uh, and then take communion together, as we have seen in the account of Abraham, we have seen Jesus is the long-expected provided Lamb of God and the long-expected blessing to all nations. So this season, let us celebrate and remember the coming of the Lamb, the coming of the blessing to all nations. Uh, Let us pray and then let us take communion together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this passage in, 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 uh, in Genesis with Abraham, Lord, and this amazing encounter, which is a, is a signpost, it is an arrow pointing to you, Jesus, the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the sacrifice which God himself provided. And Lord, we also thank you for the reminder that you are fulfilling in Jesus. You fulfilled the promise you made to Abraham, a promise that from his seed would come a blessing to all nations. And that blessing is you, Jesus. From the seed of Abraham, a blessing that is for all people. It doesn't matter what color you are what country you're from, what language you speak, what nationality you are. Jesus died for you and Jesus invites you to receive him by faith and to have your sins taken away by the provided blood of the lamb, the provided sacrifice. So Lord, I pray that this would encourage us I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, the, we would be encouraged when we go through moments of testing. And Lord, I pray, help us in those moments. Reveal the areas where we have faith. But Lord, grow us in the areas where we don't have faith. And Lord, give us that endurance. And Lord, may that encourage us because, yeah, trials are not pleasant. Testing is not pleasant. But may we be encouraged. You know what? This is a test of my faith. This is actually revealing the genuineness of my faith. Thank you. And let us, not, let us be quick. Let's be quick also to thank God when we see the genuineness of our faith being played out. Yes, at times our faith isn't perfect. But there are so many times where we have to step back and be like, God, thank you that I'm seeing that my faith is real. But not only that, Lord, thank you that I can be confident that through this you're increasing and you're growing my faith. You're growing that patient endurance. So Lord, may that it be an encouragement for us through the testing. But also over these next few weeks, may it be a chance for us to remember the coming of the Lamb. The coming of the blessing to every nation. May that invoke us to worship. May that invoke us to rejoicing. May that invoke us to share that good news with others, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being the Lamb for being the blessing. Amen.